Welcome again to Helen Judney, the Complaining Cow Consumer Show on East London Radio. And today I'm delighted to say that I've got Matt Allwright with me, who I'm sure you will know is the journalist, broadcaster, presenter, works on One Show, Rogue Traders, Watchdog and more. So Matt, welcome and thank you for joining me. Hey Helen, thanks for having me. So what I'd really like to do is just... Just I know how you started with a uh, washing machine, but how did you start with your media career in consumer stuff? Well, I started by doing a journalism degree. So but I did an English degree. I went away to Japan for three years because I was skint and because I wanted to see Japan. And then I got enough money to do a journalism course, journalism degree after that. And then I started working at the BBC. I was working at BBC South and at the same time, my mum's tumble dryer broke and she was struggling to find a tumble dryer to replace it with which she could use her favourite fabric conditioner. And it sounded to me crazy that they were selling this product, but manufacturers of tumble dryers, many of them wouldn't allow you to use it or wouldn't recommend you use it. So that felt like a story. And I said, mum, if you don't stop talking about this, I'm going to have to take it to Watchdog. And I did. And... You know, they asked me to, to do it, to write it up and to, to present it. And then here we are, what, 25 years later. I'm still doing it. I feel like that guy in the film who's, you know, his whose house is worth exactly what it was the day he bought it. And it is. But it's it's so bizarre doing something for so long when everything around you changes. You take a look at the last couple of weeks and how our sort of financial consumer landscape has changed and and trying to make sense of that it is constantly changing the stories are the same mm-hmm. but different for for years and years and years and it's it's fascinating to see our relationship with money our relationship with big companies how that's developed over that time and you know how we continually are being asked to to try and make sense of it in a new and new and different way yeah absolutely because i see that too and it's just it's really hard getting sort of your own head around it and then being able to explain it to other people and and support other people, isn't it? Yeah, exactly that. I mean, interest rates, you look at like the last week with interest rates, I've struggled to get my head around how anybody can make sense of this. And Mm. yet we do, we have to appear on screen with a degree of confidence. I mean, there are times when you've just got to turn around and say, this is unprecedented. We've never been anywhere like this before. And so whatever I tell you, you know, it, it it is literally my reaction to what I've seen with a little bit of experience and knowledge, and that's it. So I'll do my best. Um, but it can be quite daunting at times, particularly yeah. at the moment. Yeah, very much so. I had Jasmine and Bertels on the show a couple of weeks ago, sort of just and just sort of saying to her, "Can you just explain what inflation is, shrinkflation is, and just what is actually going on, and explain it in you know in layman's terms?" And um, and I think that was really helpful because. You know, we talk about it all the time, but I don't know that we really understand it. I think boiling things down to very basics is, has got to be a key skill yeah. so that you can take as many people with you as as you can. Because, I'm, you know, I know there are going to be people out there who have mortgages and are quite happy just to keep those mortgages rolling over and pay what comes out of them every month. But without really understanding the implications of big interest rises or, you know, what happens when... Uh, lenders decide to just withdraw products as they have you know Mm -hmm. your your options are narrowing all the time it's like right let's find something useful that we can offer people at the moment I'm sure you know I'm sure you you feel the same right now yeah absolutely it's but it's certainly the biggest thing we keep keep getting asked is how can people save money which is you know it's like we've sort of exhausted the list haven't we I mean that's the that's we the trouble with that ran one. Out of that, you know, we ran out of that very quickly, I think, particularly with energy bills. Mm. And, you know, th- there's a, a pressure to sort of start giving the kind of button up your cardi advice, you know, wear an extra pair of socks. And I won't do that because I just think it's it's insulting when yeah. you're dealing with, you know, 54 percent rise or an 80 percent rise in your energy bills. Those things don't make a difference. And actually it is out of people's hands there's not much they can do themselves and you have to start looking elsewhere to other people to try and resolve uh, this kind of situation. Absolutely. I mean, it's <clears throat> it's frightening, the stories that, that we're all hearing. I mean, on that note of the stories you're hearing, what, what's coming through to Watchdog at the moment? I would imagine quite a lot. 
you know, people know that there's only a limit. There's a limit to how much we can do to help mm. them with their energy bills. What people really struggle with is when communication is poor from yeah. companies. So it's like, well, look, yeah. we all know the situation. We don't need to, you know, we can't get angry with anybody or, or, or you know, start complaining about that. But what I do need to do is have you speak clearly to me about what is expected of me as a customer now mm. you know and i think that's that's been lacking in a lot of companies particularly if we look at energy companies i think the communication around meter reading and about smart meters and a, you know concerning imposing big direct debit payments on customers without really explaining what they're made of mm -hmm. you know, and how they're broken down I think that was negligent, I think, by a lot of companies. And I hope this time round, you know, because we're coming to October the 1st, I hope they're going to be better at that. And we're not going to see what felt to me like a bit of liberty taking, you know, an opportunity to, to boost their income from some people who, who they might think are not not prepared to challenge. And, yeah. you know, we know that that challenge is absolutely key in making companies sit up and be straight with us. Yeah, I'm mean, still sort of waiting really to see more from the off-gem investigation into the direct debit thing, aren't we, really? Yeah. It, this not is working quick enough. <laughs> yeah, it, it, they never are. And they're so, no. far, they're, they're so far after the event, these investigations, mm. that you've forgotten and you've moved on to the next thing. And people have only got so much headspace that, you know, we all lead incredibly busy lives and saying, look, we'll deal with this, we'll look into this, and in six months we'll let you know what's happening. By which time it, it is yesterday's um news and and i don't know you, you know if there's another mechanism that should be in place where you can say you can spot something happening and you can say right stop that now and we will investigate it but the main thing is that we minimize the damage and the harm to consumers in the very short term and then we can look at it we'll investigate it and redress maybe for the company later on rather than the consumer have to you know we so many instances over the last couple of years travel is another one where it feels like we've been used as a bank um, for big companies to get mm -hmm. them through difficult times and that's not the way it should work i mean that's what governments are for it's not what members of the public who are struggling to manage in their finances anyway are there to provide you know financial assistance to major corporations that's the wrong way around absolutely and of course i'm sure watched off sort of like that made that through the covid and all the the lockdowns and the and the travel not going and people not getting their money back from the flights i mean that was just a huge thing that's just the why wasn't enough done from the caa who seemed to be powerless you know to making sure people are getting their refunds i'm still hearing the stories from people who are not getting their refunds from flights that didn't go ahead and it's just and it's shocking because you know that those companies are just you know banking interest on that yeah, I mean, the thing we were asked, because actually I think people were being very tolerant. Customers were being mm. really accepting of the fact we were in extraordinary circumstances. And, you know, holidays couldn't go ahead. And that did mean a big hit for travel companies. But the thing that didn't happen, and we really pushed for on Watchdog, was to make travel vouchers, which were offered, or refund mm. credit notes, which were being offered, to give them the same sort of protection as your holiday had. Because, you know, we saw companies going under, and if that means your holiday and your money has gone with them, then you've got no redress whatsoever, whereas your holiday mm. did have that protection. So we pushed for that. It took a long time to get yeah. it. And it didn't feel like a difficult thing to just say, you know, if it looks like this, if your refund credit note looks like this, then it's protected the same way as your holiday was. And that's what we were we were pushing for. And to be fair, that's what the CAA were pushing for as well. So, you know, those kind of protections, although it's really technical, we're talking about thousands of pounds which are being handed over with in trust yeah. um, to companies in advance of a thing that you're looking forward to. And, you know, you're prepared to do that because, you know, that's that's the way companies, they have to put their money down with the hotel and with the flight and the rest of it. And we get that. But then in that moment, to not offer the money back and not offer something which was absolutely foolproof in all events, that felt like it. that's not the way to go. And that was, you know, that really left people in limbo about for thousands of pounds. It didn't feel right at all. No, absolutely. And it is shocking that we're still sort of seeing it because it's, you know, it's it's a while ago now, really. So it is shocking that we still see it. What what else are you seeing, sort of apart from energy and, and holidays coming through 
you know, since the last sort of six months. I think a growing trend is the kind of separation that I'm seeing between customers and their consumer rights. Mm. And it feels like that there are bodies and platforms which are operating as brokers or middlemen in some ways or, you know, selling platforms mm. which are prepared to take a, a percentage of, of every transaction. But when things go wrong, they're actually protecting the seller against any claim, uh, you know, for the consumer's rights, you mm -hmm. know, and, and you're, you know, you're so familiar, you, you know, um, consumer law inside out. It's taken decades, it's taken centuries to get to the kind of legislation that we've got now, like the Consumer Rights Act, the Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Regulations. They're really good. You know, the 14 day cooling off period, the contracts regulations, these are really useful bits of legislation mm. which come in so handy when they're properly enforced. And when you buy something, I think it is with the assumption that those laws apply. But so often now, I'm seeing stories where you say, I bought through X, I don't know who the, the original seller was, but when I tried to get my money back because the thing didn't turn up, they said that my consumer rights didn't apply and their company policy did. And unfortunately, it works. It shouldn't be that way. You should be able to go, no, I had a 14 day cooling off period. Well, if a website says, no, well, our company policy says you've got two days to send it back. That company policy, you'll never find the original seller to claim your correct consumer rights from. So that's the best you're going to get. And I think that's like an attritional wearing away of the rights that it's taken us hundreds of years to, you know, going all the way back to the co-op and, you know, making sure the scales were checked. That progress, that generation after generation, we've improved and refined and changed those those laws for the modern day. And now we've got a thing which just seems to be in a very short time, taking the effect of those laws away from us very quickly. Yeah, and I think also, but part of that is that people don't know their consumer rights. I mean, you know, you see that, I see that so much that people don't know how to how to challenge things. And I think that's that's a really big, difficult, difficult um, sort of mountain to sort of climb. And that's what I do a lot of. It's just actually, no, you need to quote this, quote that, and yeah. put it in writing. Yeah, that's that's it. I mean, that's the. That's the fundamental in the, the I wrote a book a couple of years ago, which just tried to lay out those different bits of law as simply as possible, you know, in a way that you're going to remember. And I think it's, it's a lot to take on board. You know, the consumer protection regs, there's a lot in there. There's the essence of the law, which is brilliant, that you shouldn't be misled when you're buying something. And then there's the prescribed practices. And each one of those takes a lot to get your head around. They all come down to does this feel fair? Do you yeah. feel you're yeah. fairly dealt with? Could you make a reasonable decision or were you misled in some way? That's what that piece of legislation is mm -hmm. about. And I think if people have that instinct that there is a piece of law which says that any transaction, you know, I should have had a fair crack at understanding what I was letting myself into and a, a chance to get out of it when I needed to. And if you've got that instinct built into you, then you can go and look on the detail of what it is that you might, have, you know, how you might have been misled afterwards. But you've got to have those big building blocks of, of consumer law in place to go, hold on, that's not satisfactory quality. It's not as it was described. That's the CRA 2015. Mm. I think people are, I mean, we know that people who um, work for retailers do not have that knowledge. A lot of them do. Mm -hmm. not Absolutely. Yeah. The law. So so being educated yourself is going to be your best chance because, uh, uh, you know, you will it will be news to a lot of the people you're dealing with on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's customer service uh, week next week. And uh, I'd like to see sort of far more training of, of, of staff that actually um, about consumer rights, because unless you actually stand there and say, these are my rights and and then you you flummox them so it's not yeah. fair on the on the customer service assistance either really yeah and, no absolutely and, and it backfires it should, it should be a key part of the training i mean it should be civics mm. in school it should be knowing what your rights are because we are aware of our rights probably in the political process maybe when we go to the doctors i don't know but these are things we do very occasionally whereas we buy things several times a day 
one way or the other. And we use services and goods, you know, throughout the day. And yet it still feels, it's like, where's our consumer minister? Where is our devoted consumer mm, minister mm. now? Someone who is just not looking after small businesses and the consumer. It's like, I get it. Small businesses are one thing, but we're all consumers. Everybody in this country is consuming on one level or another. We should have a devoted consumer minister looking after our rights. And that, again, is just that slight attrition of the importance of consumer justice, you know, and making sure we get the thing that we've paid for. And it feels like it's just been it's been eaten away at sort of year on year, one way or another. Yeah, absolutely. Totally, totally agree. I mean, you do a lot in the in the housing sort of sector, don't you? Sort of renting and and lunch. what were the sort of the horrors that you're seeing and hearing about now? We've had some big changes over the last what forty years, I would say, in housing, and we have to look at our housing situation in the context of those changes. The first one was right to buy. And, you know, the idea that people could buy their own council houses, which, you know, has been was a hugely popular policy and was, you know, through successive governments, Labour and Conservative and the coalition was was upheld. And, you know, those people who have been able to turn themselves from renters into homeowners, like support it hugely. And, and for them, obviously, it's it's been fantastic. The second one is the Housing Act of 1988, which gave us the the short short hold tenancy and the section 21 notice now what that means is that typically anybody renting will have a six month fixed period at the beginning and then a rolling tenancy after that and can be evicted without fault with two months notice now you look at where we are at the moment where we have mortgage rates interest rates going up if you're a buy to let landlord that means your costs Let's say you spread yourself thin, you've got a lot of properties on buy-to-let mortgages with small deposits. Suddenly, you've got this huge debt, which has been at 0.5% or based on 0.5%, is now going up, we are told, to 6%. What are you going to do? You're going to raise the rent. You're mm. going to put the mm. rent up. That's your first, pro maybe not your first thought. Maybe you'll think of selling some property. I don't know. But a lot of landlords, they don't buy to sell. They buy to rent and to because that's their income. So there's a good chance you're going to pass on some or all of that cost to your tenants. That means rent rises and nobody's wages are going up right now. Very few people's wages are going up. So faced with that, you have a rent rise that possibly you can't afford and a no fault eviction on the other side of it, which means that you might have to find a new home with two months notice. And with that, we're not talking about individuals, just individuals or couples anymore. Families are renting, you know, mm. large number. Mm. We've got 11 million renters in the country. Those are people who might have to find new schools, who might be further away from their families and their support structures, from their jobs, and have two months to sort all of that out. Starting from this moment, you've got two months to be somewhere else that you can afford if that exists. That, <laughs> that, just that is a situation. That's where we're at. And mm -hmm. you could, as a landlord, you could be listening to me and say, well, you don't understand what it's like to be a landlord. You don't know how difficult tenants are. You don't know the, the costs that I have. I totally get that. That is your business. And I'm on the side of, side of the consumer. It's my job to understand your business. And it's great when people can work this out together. But it does feel to me as if the power is with the landlord right now and not so much with the tenant. And, you know, there will be landlords listening who go, demonising landlords, it's the same old story. You know, we're trying to just, like, this is our business, we're trying to provide homes for people, who's going to do it if we don't? I totally get that. There's 11 million renters. And mm. it just feels like two months is a very short time to reorganise your life when rents can be raised almost, there are some controls, but raised almost at will, if that's what's happening elsewhere in that neighborhood so it's worrying it's really worrying and mm. the standard of, of of a lot of private rented accommodation is is not up to scratch um, and it does mean that we have people living in you know housing that's not decent you know for one reason or another so yeah that it is it is a big passion of mine housing because I think everything else that we do 
it's all on that platform of a good home, hopefully mm. a good home. Education doesn't work if kids don't sleep well at night because there's damp on the walls or they don't have a proper bed. You know, health is affected by poor housing. Relationships are affected by poor housing. Employment, how do you go to work if your clothes are damp or if you haven't had a decent hot shower in the morning? Everything that we do is affected by housing. I think it's the one area of our lives that, again, we've had successive housing ministers coming through one after another. They get their feet under the table, many of them with really good intentions. You know, I know some of these guys and they have really good ideas and intentions. Wow. Six months later, they're gone. They moved on. Mm, uh, mm. And that continuity is what's missing. Just one person who goes, I'm not going anywhere. This is what I believe in. This is what I need to fix because it's not working. Yeah. And because when we saw the the consumer bill and paper and that took years and it still seems to be on the, on the back burner as to what changes are coming in the consumer world it's it's really worrying i think and it's it doesn't get the the coverage that i think it should have as, as you say housing is the bedrock of of everything and it's and unless you're seeing sort of programs like you know the rogue traders traders and, and things that you do or the odd dispatches or panorama on landlords people tend to pick you know pigeonhole it i think you know, saying that people don't necessarily or it doesn't affect me so yeah. I, I think so, but I think it's breaking out of that now. Yeah. Where, you know, yeah. there was a, a point where, you know, you could easily push renters to one side. So many of us are renting now. And I tell you what, looking at the way things are going, a lot more, maybe, you know, if, if interest rates mm. continue to rise and people start to lose their homes, that's going to be the option. If that's the case, we we need to make sure that the balance between landlords and renters is equal so that they both benefit. So there is a, you know, a nice level playing field between the two and both can say, I have something to offer and I have something that I need from you. And you know, that kind of mutuality and that, that kind of cooperation, that's the basis of healthy marketplaces where both people know they have something to offer and they have um, something that they need and they can you know, work together to that end. Yeah, and what, what are your thoughts on the, the proposed new ombudsman in this area, if it actually happens? I think a lot of this is about, it's actually about people, how many people are there to sort these situations out. And, you know, making housing enforcers, you know, we made it for five years, six years. And you just see the numbers of environmental health officers in, in local authorities just drop and drop. Mm. And it, you can bring in laws which say that homes must be a decent standard. Who's enforcing those? How do they get through the door? How do they find out that homes are not of a decent standard, particularly when you've got tenants inside who are worried about revenge evictions? Section 21, just there you go, two months, get out. How honest are you going to be about the state of your home if it's the only one you feel you stand a chance of ever achieving? And if your next one also requires a, a sizable deposit to get you through the door, there are so many questions to be answered. If you do insist on enforcing higher standards, you've got to give people the resources to do that as well. And that would mean a proper investment if it's going to be local authorities to do it. And I, you know, they're probably best placed to do it, in my opinion. But you have to put the money behind that, mm. not just mm. come up with the latest initiative which only lasts as long as your tenure before somebody else comes through the door. Yeah, it's depressing times, isn't it, really? Yeah, but, it, it, but these things do change. And, yeah. and what happens, um, and, you know, what I love seeing is when there is a widespread recognition that there's a problem and there is pressure to sort it out because that's kind of, that's society in action, isn't it? That's when, yeah. when you do recognise a problem and say, well, that can't, you know, I wouldn't want to live like that. I, you know, that's that's no way to raise a family. Those like really basic observations and questions that we all start asking. That's what leads to positive change. And, you know, there are great politicians on both sides of the house who are really about um, on all sides of the house, I should say, who are really about improving people's lives. And if those people can, you know, pursue what they believe in and the thing that really makes them tick and you know, then that's how change happens. And 
you know, it's the only way that change happens is, is that you've got people with uh, resilience and, and perseverance really like chasing down the thing that needs to change, that needs to progress. So we're at that moment right now, you know, where we mm. can see there's a lot of stuff needs fixing. And we've all got a lot of different ideas about how it's going to work. But it's a, it is a great opportunity, you know, if you look at it that way to say we've, we've reached possibly, let's hope, <laughs> the bottom in many mm. of our metrics. Right, what can we do? How can we move this on? How can we make it better? Yeah, I think you're right. It's just it's just got to the point that, <laughs> you know, God forbid it can get any any worse. But there are <laughs> enough people now, I think, that are shouting. And there have been those of us that have been shouting for a long time. But I think the fact that so many people are now beginning to see what happens and also the different areas, you know, seeing health come in, mental health, physical health, the fact that housing affects so many, as you say, that actually it's now going to have, I think, more organisations and people realising that something has got to change. So hopefully there will be a change for the better. Yeah, I do. I do hope so. And the, I'm, I'm really lucky in the job that I do is that a big part of it, particularly with the stuff I do with The One Show, is about finding people who are doing the most amazing things for their communities and who are doing it selflessly without any mm. kind of thought of recognition, but just because they they want to see better outcomes. They want to see people have better lives. I think the, the pandemic sort of gave us all a little glimpse of that as well. Yeah. You know, we had a moment where all we had to do, a lot of us, was look after each other. And when you reduce, when you whether you call it government or just life, to that, to just the, like, let's stay healthy, let's stay as happy as we can, then everything else becomes a bit of an abstraction of that, doesn't it? Because there isn't anything more important than that, you know, mm. and whatever it takes to make, make people healthy and happy, money is not, is not, becomes unimportant as long as you're healthy and happy. Yeah. So, well, I've got what I've got, but I'm okay, you know, and if you are happy, there's a good chance you live in a really, you know, a place that, that is looking after you, you know, so housing, it, that's something that contributes to it along with everything else. But that's all that we should be aiming for, really. And, and really focus on that and however we can make that happen that's how we should do it absolutely it seems a good note to uh, to end on that we are hopefully affecting some change so it just leaves me to say thank you very much for your time Matt it's been really interesting talking to you where can where can people find you on social media and your book and everything well I don't know how I did it but I managed to secure on Twitter and Instagram my name Matt Allwright you'll find me there and um, it's always lovely to hear I get so many more contacts from people than I can respond to mm. um, so when people do get in touch oh I've all got, also got a um, an email tell at mattallright.com and my website is mattallright.com that's a good way to get in touch if there's a longer story you want to tell me and again I can't answer I can only ever answer a fraction of the stuff mm. that comes through but I read it all um, I say that you know, I'll probably get a tidal wave of stuff that I can't possibly. Read. But it, <laughs> I do. It's really useful to me to to see what people are, you know, getting in touch and wanting help with. And if I can't answer, it's not it's not personal. It doesn't mean I haven't read it. it just means I can only answer really those that I feel I can help out with. Mm. Okay. Well, <clears throat> that just leaves me to say to everybody, thank you for listening to me, the Complaining Cow, on the Complaining Cow Consumer Show. And you can find more help and advice about consumer rights and topical issues on the Complaining Cow website, The Complaining Cow, Twitter at Complaining Cow, Facebook, The Complaining Cow, and Instagram, Complaining Cow. And of course, you can find out everything on Watchdog. And if you have any consumer topics you'd like me to cover or any consumer issue you'd like help with, you can contact me on helen at eastlondonradio.org.uk and you can get 15% off How to Complain, the essential consumer guide to getting refunds redress and results and 101 habits of an effective complainer with code ELR15 on the Complaining Cow website. And you'll also see a review from Matt on that second book. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Thanks very Bye. much. Helen. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.